Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for bearing with us and hope you're grinning at the same time. Perhaps that's a you know, prophetic, um, prophetic title, Grin and Bear It. Um, we had some technical issues earlier on. Uh, I'm grateful for my panel of speakers who are taking in all questions. And so no time in lo is lost um, in that sense because questions are being asked and uh, answers are being given. Um, welcome everyone to this uh, medical webinar. Um, welcome to our um, alumni. Welcome to our students. Welcome to Haslinda, uh, the current principal. Welcome to Mrs. Kami Lim, our ex-principal. Well, and on behalf of the RGS family, we welcome our guests to Grin and Bear It. Um, allow me to, um, uh, you know, update everyone on the house rules. Um, this uh, webinar is being uh, recorded and at the same time live streamed. Um, please wait for all the speakers, our three awesome speakers to complete their speeches before um, our Q&A session. And on behalf of my um, chairperson as well uh, of our task force, Dr. Go Su Yen, I welcome warmly everyone. Without further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker, um, Dr. Ling, who is a spine surgeon um, at a Glosser Hospital. To everyone in UK, I greet you. Good morning. And uh, with a cup of coffee in your hands, I'm sure you guys are excited um, to listen to what Ling has to say. So right now, I'm going to look at Ling's amazing bio and read to you um, what she has done. So Dr. Hui Ling Ke is an orthopedic spine consultant working in Gloucester. She was born in the UK, but at the age of 10 years old, moved with her family to Singapore and was a student at Raffles Girls School from 1990 to 1994. After that, she returned to the UK to study her A-levels where she attended the Perth School for Girls in Cambridge. Following her A-levels, she did her undergraduate medical degree at St. Mary's Medical School, which is now part of Imperial College School of Medicine in London. During this time, she also achieved an intercalated BSc in Speech Science and Communication at University College London, which is like Imperial College, is also part of the University of London. As if this is not enough, during her career, Dr. Kerr has worked in general medicine, accident and emergency, general surgery, gynecology, as well as orthopedics. She made the decision to become an orthopedic surgeon in 2007 and completed her training in Bristol in 2018. Besides completing the MRCS and FRCS examination during her training, she also has an MSc in Medical Examination Honours, sorry, Medical Education Honours, and has published 10 research papers, one of which is in medical, uh, British Medical Journal. Amazing woman. Before taking up her consultant position in 2020, she completed spine fellowships in London, Ontario, Canada, as well as Cardiff, Wales. Dr. Kerr has an interest in gender discrimination discrepancy in surgery, plus factors relating to the recruitment and retention of trainees to spine surgery. She is the diversity representative for the British Association of Spine Surgeons. Her hobbies include painting, the one that is behind her, you can see the beautiful painting, amongst others, art. <coughs> she lives in Bristol with a civil partner, Gwen, and their dog, Mu. Over to you. Dr. Ling. Well, thank you, Job, for that wonderful uh, um, um, presentation of my, my background. Uh, and thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. It really is an honor. Um, I'll just share my screen. Okay, can everyone see the screen? Fantastic. Um, so, uh, so as, as uh, Job said, I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon based in Gloucester. What that means is, uh, is that um, I fix bones, essentially. That's what an orthopedic spine surgeon does. So, and I'd have a general orthopedic uh, practice. So, so I'll fix things like hips, uh, wrist fractures, uh, ankle fractures, and so forth. 
But my subspecialty is spine. So uh, I'll treat patients with spine conditions such as sciatica, uh, spine infections, spine fractures, uh, spine uh, tumors and trauma. Uh, so uh, back to the introduction, as Jog said, um, I was born in the UK and I uh, lived in Singapore from the age of 10 to 16 years, which were quite formative years. Uh, I graduated from RGS in, in 1994 and I went to St. Mary's Medical School in, in London uh, between 97 to 2004. And that's a photograph of uh, my class uh, in my last year of being in RGS. And that's me in the center. And you can see the date there, old school type photograph, 1994. And I have no, I'm, I'm sure things have changed quite a bit since then. So the kind of work I do now, uh, this is where I work, Gloucestershire Royal Hospital. And I thought I've got a few slides of the kind of work I do uh, just to show you guys uh, what is in my everyday practice. Uh, this slide on the right is of a, um, a one of my patients. Uh, he's a gentleman in his 50s. And as you can see, this is a sort of cut through the center of the spine looking from the side. And you can see where uh, unfortunately infection destroyed a disc, intervertebral disc in his neck, uh, causing the collapse of the one bone on the other. And you can see the black stripe here is a spinal cord, which is being squeezed. And although he was uh, pretty much neurologically intact when I saw him, if we didn't operate on this, this would eventually collapse, causing him to be paralyzed. So I had to do an operation called a two level corpectomy, where you take, you literally remove both of these bones. And in it, in that place, it goes uh, an expandable cage and the plate on top. And when I spoke to him on the phone uh, just yesterday, he was doing extremely well. So um, that's, uh, you know, I've preserved, we preserved him from losing his, his legs and his, and his function. Here's another patient. Uh, this lady had actually been in a wheelchair for two years uh, when I met her and her spine, spinal cord is completely clear, except with this one location here where it's pinched. And you can see on this cross-sectional view, the thing in the center this is the spinal cord. It should be a nice round shape with fluid all around it, but it's really squeezed. So I had to do an operation where we remove uh, the posterior section and uh, stabilize it at the same time with scaffolding that goes into the spine. And these are the pedicle screws and rods. And when I spoke to her last week, um, you know, she's no longer even using crutches anymore. And for the first time in two years is able to do some housework. Uh, here's another patient of mine. He was a young man, uh, 27 years old, and uh, he was absolutely crippled by this disc herniation you can see right here. Your intervertebral disc can uh, spit out their contents uh, under axial load. And um, you can see on this cross section here, this stuff here on the left hand side of the canal is, is squashing his sac of nerves, the dural tube, and that's been pushed all the way to the back. And this man was in absolute agony. He couldn't walk, he couldn't run. He had a foot drop and um, I had to do an operation. And this picture is taken from the British Association of Spine Surgeons uh, patient information website. And the surgery is quite delicate. You have to remove a small portion of bone to make a bony window to get into the spine, delicately push the nerves to one side without damaging them and taking out that piece of disc that's underneath to free up space for the nerves. And when I spoke to them on the phone this week, he's doing extremely well, running back to normal, normal life. So uh, happy days. So, you know, you have to, when you think about the journey, how I went from being this like rather awkward geeky girl in 94 to where I am now, and I have to say this photograph, I mean, I think I was called the class yeller because I had a really loud voice, uh, but in, in hindsight, it's actually something quite useful for theater. Uh, and to where I'm now, it's quite a journey and I'll, I'd like to uh, tell you about my journey. So as George mentioned, I came back to the UK to do some A-levels and then went to medical school and I really have worked all over the UK. I've circled um, some of the places I've worked during my journey uh, and, uh, and showing my travels. Uh, and I've lived in these places as well. Um, it took me four years to get my orthopedic uh, registrar number. And I remember uh, um, one of the questions was you know, how difficult it is to get into residency training or registrar training. Well, uh, it took me four years, uh, but I did get there in the end. I got into the Bristol Deanery in 2011. And then after doing extra degrees and things like that, I qualified as a, a, an orthopedic spine surgeon in 2017. And I went on to do fellowships abroad and in, in Wales, uh, uh, which were very enlightening. And then I took up a, a, a consultancy post in Gloucester a year ago. Uh, in addition, these are things mentioned by Jorg 
uh, uh, including my gap year in Canada and um, six months I spent in Germany doing uh, language school uh, publications, presentations. But of course, in addition, and this is what Suyin and I talked about, uh, life experience is very important. Uh, I, I'm proud to say that I worked in my our family restaurant from 2004, uh, 94, all the way till um, halfway through medical school. And even now, if I go back, I'll probably be roped in into serving customers. Um, I did work as an eight healthcare assistant, which is very enlightening. And uh, in my gap year in Canada, I lived in Large Cape Breton, which is a community where able-bodied people live with people with disabilities. I'm also an avid painter. This is one of my paintings when Gwen and I went camping and you can see our little dog there. Uh, and I also own and manage five properties, which is quite a lot of work. And I'm the British Association of Spinal Surgeons Diversity Rep. Um, of course, it's not always rosy. I have got failures to admit. Um, when I was in Singapore, unfortunately, I didn't do as well in my O levels I was, would have liked. And here's full disclosure, I only got four A's, three B's and a C. In the UK, this isn't considered terribly bad, but compared to all my schoolmates who were getting, you know, seven and eight A's, uh, I was very ashamed. And um, when I went to medical school, I did have to retake medical finals, which extended my studies by six months. And uh, when I did the master's, the Royal College of Surgeons exam, which you need to pass to become a registrar, I failed the viber part and had to do that, that again. I can say that for two, at least two of these failures, I cried for about two or three weeks after the, after my, the results. But it, the reason why I brought it up is because I want you guys to know that if those of you who are thinking about this journey, do not be scared or worried about failure. There's always a positive you can take from it. Certainly for me, I learned a lot about myself. I worked out what study techniques work for me and how much self-discipline I need to get the results I want. I think uh, with the medical exam stage, I, I think I became a better doctor for it. The knowledge did stay with me longer than it normally would. And I, later on in life, I, I had no failure at crucial stages. So here's the first lesson really, which is that failure is part of the pathway to success. And I think it's not a bad mantra to say to yourself if you've had a bad day or a down day, uh, or, or you've had some failure. And the truth is, is that everybody fails, but does everyone learn from the experience? And this is what we've all got to ask ourselves. Here are some of the other obstacles that will get in your way uh, if you're women in, in orthopedic surgery. Uh, this is a slide from the Royal College of Surgeons. And back in 1991, so when I was a kid in Singapore, it was only 3% of the women, uh, 3% of the orthopedic, spines, uh, orthopedic surgeons were women. And even in the modern age, tw you know, 21st century, we're only up to 13.2%, but it is slowly growing year on year, and we're hopeful this will continue to rise. Um, this in, in spine surgery is even worse at present. So um, I, as I said, I'm a member of the British Association of Spine Surgeons and I'm their diversity rep. We gathered some membership data from, from this year, and it shows that only 4% of the consultant body are, are female, and that out of 316 people, that equates to something like 12 people. Um, all of which, most of whom I, I know personally. And then uh, because I'm the diversity rep, I'm invited to attend the executive meetings, which are once every two months. And it's like this really, uh, you know, all men, and then there's me who feels like the token girl. And these all very distinguished colleagues, uh, uh, quite serious sober colleagues. I've caught them in a moment where they're smiling. Uh, but uh, the, the, you know, this kind of environment can be quite daunting as a lone female. And equally, when we go to the conferences, it's a sea of men and then just maybe one or two girls in the, it, it dotted around. So this is what you have to uh, be aware of. Um, and, you know, quite a lot has been published about this. Uh, this lady here in the picture on the top right is uh, Michelle Ryan. She's, she's a professor of psychology in Exeter and she's done a lot of work on this. And, and, it, and some of the evidence suggests that if women don't see role models or, or people like themselves at the top of the tree, it'll deter them from applying or even trying because <coughs> the thought is if you don't, um, if you can't see that your sacrifices will be rewarded, then people aren't, women aren't gonna make those sacrifices. Equally, they found that if men uh, feel they don't fit that stereotype of maybe the macho male that's in that profession, then they will be deterred from applying as well. And so it leads to quite, a homogenous uh, group of people in those positions. So yes, the lack of role models does affect women. 
but it also does affect certain men too. And then we've got to be mindful of that. In addition, um, when I've spoken to junior uh, female colleagues about whether they'd like to consider a career in orthopedics, so medical students and junior doctors, often I'm, I'm told that, oh, I don't think I'm strong enough. And, and these are some of these myths that we need to de deconstruct no matter what profession you want to go into. Thirdly, I'd like to talk about unconscious bias. What's unconscious bias? Well, it's the predictable pathway your brain will take you down when you're trying to visualize or imagine something. And this is hardwired into our brains because evolutionarily, we need to be able to distinguish friend from foe. And that's why your brain will always look to the familiar. And therefore, if, you, if all you've ever known uh, of surgeons are males, whether they're Caucasian males, or in Singapore, I suppose, uh, people from uh, Southeast Asian origin, then when you close your eyes, that's what you'll visualize. And the unconscious bias position uh, could lead you to look at this picture on the right and think that automatically that the, the guy is the surgeon and the girl's the nurse, when it may well be the other way around. And because this is hardwired in all of us, we all have a responsibility to unpick these unconscious biases and bring them into the conscious sphere of thinking so that we can look and, and, and regulate our own behavior. Um, if you are a, a woman and good at your job, it may be that some of the obstacles you encounter are, are bullying and hate. And, and these are two examples that I've encountered in my own uh, career. Um, there are two phrases on, on the screen. Both phrases were said about me or to me by other male uh, spine surgeons in, in clinical environments. The first phrase was said uh, to me, or well, at me, but out of earshot when I was um, after a particularly fractured stay in theatre by a more junior colleague, and you all recognise it as hate speech. It was said out of earshot, but it was definitely meant for me. And the second phrase, my minion will do that, was said by a senior spine colleague when I was a senior trainee, just like that with a finger pointing at me in, in, on a ward in front of nurses. Now, um, although I don't necessarily consider uh, both people that said these things necessarily bad people, but I consider them that they've given into their unconscious biases, whether they, they think that as a, for the first colleague, whether he thought that as a woman, I'm not worthy of my position, and therefore it's easier to use hate speech against me. And for the second one, because I'm small and Chinese, uh, maybe he, the unconscious bias position is that I'm subservient and uh, demure and therefore it's easier to call me a minion than if I was a tall Caucasian male. So, you know, the, this is what you may encounter and you'll have to learn how to cope and deal with this. Um, but let's bust some orthopedic myths. Um, this man here is a, a chap called Michael Ain, and he, as you can see, he's a dwarf, but he's also an orthopedic spine surgeon and he, he does deformity. He's based in, in Baltimore in America. Now, I know he exists because a friend of mine met him at a conference and he came back saying, Ling, there's, a, there's an orthopedic spine surgeon that's a dwarf. And I thought, this is amazing. I, I, and I got so excited. I went to work and I told my colleagues about it. But they all said to me, Ling, he's pulling your leg. There's no such thing. It's absolutely impossible. But if you look him up, he exists. This man does exist. And can you imagine the difficulties he overcome came in his life to get to where he is? And therefore, if you think about it, if a dwarf can become a spinal surgeon, well, as a girl, can you become a surgeon? Of course you can. So these are people where we can learn from their experiences. I think um, the second lesson to learn is um, um, really about yourself. Um, Socrates, this phrase, to know thyself is the beginning of, beginning of wisdom, is, is, was, is attributed to Socrates and Aristotle, his disciple. And I think um, the first part of being able to work out where you want to go in life is to work out who you are as a person. What do you like? What do you not like? What are your weaknesses? What are your strengths? How can you get better? And I think I brought up the last phrase here, what kind of suffering do I want? Because it's, it's sometimes is a better and easier way to think of your life, what, what, because all careers, all life that carries suffering. And if you can work out what kind of suffering you want to avoid, perhaps that's an easy way to think about how, what kind of career you want for yourself. And the, and the person, the resource you can look at is this chap here, Alain de Baton, who's considered a modern pop philosopher who talks about these issues. Uh, he's written a number of books and, and presentations that be able to look up uh, for yourselves. And um, for those of you who are, who are Avatar fans, 
uh, uh, Uncle Iroh, who's one of the characters here, asks Prince Zuko, you know, you've got to ask, start asking yourself the big questions. Who are you and what do you want? And I think this is what all young people should be, should be thinking to themselves. You know, it isn't easy. There are going to be difficult personalities you'll, you'll encounter. I've mentioned some of the things that have happened to me. And I would say the literature suggests up to 10% of uh, people out there have narcissistic personality disorder, depending on uh, which field you're working in. And they are, really are the Donald Trumps of the world. And if you're a good person, they, they may try to hurt you or, or, or harm you. Uh, and I have to say, unfortunately, there are a lot of people that you would recognize as having these qualities in medicine, particularly in surgery. Um, and you'll have to find a way to manage these, these, these individuals. Um, if, you, if they are unmanageable, then try your best to keep contact to minimum. And sometimes you, you've got no choice but to try and avoid them altogether. But you will have to work with some of these people and, and, and find out a way to do it. But do not let it detract you from your goal. You must be brave to overcome these obstacles. And please don't be scared of failure. As I said before, failure is part of the pathway to success. And if you don't try, you don't know. And as a, a female in a male dominated profession, you do have to dare to be different in order to, to get your goal. And if you ever have a crisis of confidence, think about Michael Aiden and what he's achieved and where you can go. Of course, uh, there will be sacrifices, your own time, your own money, your own energy, and also your emotions. It's, it's not easy. There'll be days when you cry and days when you laugh hysterically, but you'll have to find a, a way. And um, just to give you an example um, of, of my own sacrifices, when I first got my training number, which was in Bristol, which has took me four years to get that number, uh, I was living in not working in Nottingham at the time. And um, because I didn't have a place to live in Bristol, I was trying to save money. I stayed in hospital accommodation and drove up and down the week, up and down the motorway every weekend to spend time with my partner who was living in Nottingham. And that meant 4 a.m. starts on a, on a Monday and getting home at sort of 7, 8, 9 p.m. on a Friday. And I did that for three years. In addition, uh, when I did my master's, I worked 12 uh, play, hospitals all over the UK, including Plymouth. So there was even a time for three months when I was driving once or twice a week from Nottingham to Plymouth, which you can see is halfway around the country. My, when my car died last year, it had done about almost 245,000 miles. And just to put that into context, um, into context, oh, oh. <laughs> I had a picture of a, a, a globe with uh, 24,000 miles. The, the circumference of the globe is 24,000 miles. And therefore I'd driven something like 10 times the circumference of the earth in the last 13 years. So there you go. Oh, there it is. There's, there's the globe. OK, but whatever you do, always, always, always be nice to people. It opens far more doors than if you are aggressive and rude and horrible. And always be courteous and polite. Now, I've got two uh, photographs on the screen. One is of Dolly Parton. The other one is of Louis Theroux. And if you just listen to the way these people talk, uh, they never have a nasty, unkind word to say about anyone. They always are, they, they, they seem to be very open-minded and are able to talk to people in such a way it opens doors, particularly Louis Theroux, he's very skilled at this. And you can learn from listening to other people how to talk to people, how to be nice to people. Um, I would encourage all of us to treat each other with dignity, respect and civility, no matter uh, where in life you come from and what station you, you have in life. Uh, and always treat some people around you with kindness, because to be honest, there but for the grace of God go I, and the person sitting across the table from you anywhere um, it could be you. So, so always be kind. Um, the next lesson is to not waste opportunities. All of us can be our own worst self-saboteurs, and uh, I certainly uh, have wasted opportunities in the past, but this is part of the learning process. The more you learn about yourself, the more likely you'll be able to uh, not be a self-saboteur and um, get go work towards your goal. But you must listen to your intuition and, and, and to work out who you are as a person. Also, don't despair. If you miss an opportunity, there will be more. Uh, my mother always used to say, if one door closes, another door opens. And I think she's absolutely right. And the, the thing about medicine, it is a long, long, uh, a, 
a pathway. Um, I mean, I started my journey uh, in, I went to medical school in 1997, and I only became a consultant last year in 2020, which is what, 23 years of, of working and studying and taking exams. But uh, I, I'm, I'm so happy. I enjoy, I enjoy my work immensely. I, I enjoy my life immensely. And ultimately, it's a marathon, not a race. So, don't, you know, the main thing is endurance. Can you, do you have the endurance to get to the top? And I would say that all of us do, as long as it's what you want. You have, that this is why you've got to know who you are, to make sure you know you want it. Uh, how do you stay healthy and sane throughout the whole process? Because it is a long and arduous process. Well, I would say always be kind to yourself. Um, there's no point beating yourself up with thoughts of guilt uh, or, or regrets about mistakes you've made in the past. They're in the past, move on. You've got to look to the future and how you can make your life better from, from now on. Um, I would say it's really, really important to talk to people. You must find someone to talk to. It can be your parents, your siblings, your friends, uh, your partner, um, a therapist, but you must talk to someone to air out your feelings. If you don't air out your feelings, what will happen is they'll bottle up inside and it'll come out in strange and destructive ways later on. So please find a confidant to talk to. It's really important to look after your body as well. Um, and I mean, by looking after your body, I don't mean going out and doing huge amount, amounts of exercise. I mean, eating healthily. And that means real food, food that's, that's not come out of a packet food that you prepared and cooked yourself. Being well nourished is so important. And I, oh, I can't stress how important it is to maximize your vegetables. I'm telling all of my patients to consider going plant-based 80% of the time, which is kind of how I live. And um, because you want to help your gut microbiome and also in, in provide enough nutrients for your immune system so you can repair yourself. And, and be also be aware that you need to prioritize sleep if you are gonna repair yourself. Um, pe most humans don't know that, that your brain washes itself when you sleep and the washing phase only happens towards the last phase of sleep, so the last hour of sleep, uh, and most uh, human sleep cycle is about four hours. So you need two washing phases for your brain overnight, which is, equates to seven and a half to eight hours. So please prioritize your sleep if you want to uh, stay well. Um, there is a massive worldwide um, epidemic of lack of sleep right now. And if you listen to any of the professors sleep talking, it's going to lead to huge amounts of dementia and other health problems. So all of us must prioritize sleep. There is nothing brave or macho in saying I only got three hours sleep last night because I was doing work. That is completely ridiculous and, and will kill you eventually. Um, because I'm a spine surgeon, uh, I'll put in a little slide about how to protect your spine. As you will call at the beginning of my talk, this is the, uh, X, uh, the MRI scan of the young man who I did a disc herniation uh, excision for. Now you can see that the disc, intervertebral discs higher up have a white color in them. That's because they're more normal and are normally uh, fluid, have more fluid in them. But as you get older, you can start to lose fluid. And this man was only 27. So, you know, it can happen as early as your 20s where you start to lose that hydration and become, these discs become a darker color. With that lack of hydration, the discs become like slightly deflated tires. They lose their turga. And like a deflated tire that you might ride on your bicycle, the spine will do the same, will wobble a bit. With that wobbling, uh, the intervertebral the discs with the, with the cartilage rings on the outside can undergo she more shear stress. And that shear stress can cause the cartilage rings to bust. And with the axial load, the contents can come out and then you can get this disc herniation. So it's really important to stay hydrated to protect your spine. Um, what I do every day when I wake up, first thing I drink is a large glass of decaffeinated uh, red bush tea, which has got plenty of antioxidants, uh, or, or you can drink a large glass of water as, as, if you like, but make sure you stay hydrated. And another tip I would have is to try and avoid caffeine after lunch. The, the, the quarter life of caffeine is 12 hours. So whatever cup of coffee you drink at midday, a quarter of it's in your system at midnight, and it'll keep you keep you dry and it'll also um, stop you from sleeping well so remember what I said sleep is very important to heal therefore um, sleep well and stay hydrated um, please pay attention to the posture of your spine as you can see in the in the um, top section the top image here a, a bunch of positions people use to try and pick things up from the floor I can say that this position here is very bad 
uh, where the person's leaning forward, all of that pressure of the, of the trunk is on the intervertebral disc. And therefore, I would encourage all of you, if you're getting anything from the floor, even if it's a pen, to squat, use your legs. Your legs are much stronger than your back to help you um, stay, um, um, keep, it, keep your back healthy, to reduce that huge pressures on the intervertebral discs. Um, as I said before, it's important to stay nourished so you are healthy, and that means eating vegetables, but please avoid obesity because, as you can remember, think about it, all that weight is hanging off that last little disc there. Avoid uh, poor manual handling techniques, which I've mentioned above. And remember, um, core strength training, which are your core muscles, are not just your abdominals, which are at the front of your body, but your paraspinal muscles at the back. And therefore, these are the muscles that give you, uh, help you balance. And any kind of exercise that will help you uh, maintain your balance will uh, promote uh, good spine health. So the exercises I tell my patients to take up are things like swimming, exercise biking, or, or, or um, uh, push biking, if they're, if they're safe enough to do so, yoga and Pilates. I would say yoga is particularly good because it make, allows you to stretch out your spine and stretch out those muscles. And um, if you get a little vacuum effect on the disc, it can hopefully prevent um, some of those problems, but mainly it's to help you train your core muscles so you stay balanced. Uh, you help it helps you balance. We all practice balancing the exercises when we're small children. There's no reason why we should stop when we get older. So, in summary, um, these are this is the sort of journey I've undertaken in order to try and uh, to get uh, to where I am now. Uh, I'd encourage all of you to think about these things. Um, failure is part of the pathway to success, so don't be afraid to fail. Know yourself so that you can ha know how to be, uh, stop being a self-saboteur and also to get the most out of your career. Uh, be aware of difficult personalities, but find a way to overcome them and overcome obstacles. Dare to be different. Um, you have to be brave to enter a man's world uh, that, or, 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 or a world or a career that's male-dominated. Be prepared to make sacrifices. Uh, and be nice to people. It opens far more doors than uh, being horrible. Uh, don't waste opportunities and make sure you prioritize your sleep and health. And again, for the Avatar fans out there, if you can uh, uh, think about these things, uh, then hopefully we can all achieve our Avatar state. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'll, uh, and I'll hand it back to Jog now. Thank you so much, Ling. Um, I'm just panting listening to you. You're awesome, amazing. You're epitome of green and bear it. You know, 23 years from 1997 to year 2020 to become a consultant. You're amazing, awesome. And I'm surprised to know that you should avoid caffeine after lunch. And I love your idea of, you know, paraspinal muscles. That's a new set of muscles I'm going to work, I'm going to be working on. And I hope the rest of you will as well. There's so much take away from your talk and I really appreciate it. Um, next thank you speaker. very much. Thank you, Ling. Thank you for listening. Thank you for speaking and sharing. The next speaker I'd like to uh, call upon is uh, Dr. Alison Pua. And uh, to show my vintage, Alison Pua is actually the niece of my schoolmate, my year mate. Alison, Dr. Alison Poir moved to England in 2012 and graduated from the University of Bristol in 2017 with a Bachelor of Dental Surgery. After that, she worked at various locations around UK, including a post doing hospital-based oral and maxillofacial surgery. She currently practices dentistry in Bristol and has continued her education in oral surgery and IV sedation. Dr. Poa has a strong interest in public education. She has presented dental education topics to a variety of audiences, such as primary school children and carers at a care home for the elderly. She will be sharing about dental issues in our modern society and talking about what a dental career entails. She's also happy to talk about her life and education in UK and will welcome and will welcome any and all questions as this may be a topic of interest for current RGS girls and their families. 
talking about RGS girls, we welcome also uh, the principal, Haslinda, who is actually watching us on live stream. To those of you on live stream, grateful welcome to you all. And now we have over 100 in our um, chat group, our webinar. Great thanks to Shimin. I must make a shout out for her. It's a lot of work with the, when there's a technical failure. She's done a great job. Over to you, Alison. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Alison. I'm a dentist. My talk is called What's Behind a Smile, and I will be talking about dental issues in our modern society that are becoming more and more of a problem. So just a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm from the class of 2008. I loved my time in RGS. Some of my closest friends are still fellow RGS girls. It was a great four years there. And then I had another two, two years in RJC. I graduated in 2010 and I moved to the UK in 2012 for university and I chose to study in Bristol. It's a lovely city. It's very vibrant. Lots of great food here. Um, and nine years later, I'm still living here. And that photograph, that's me standing in front of the Bristol Dental Hospital on the morning of my graduation day. My mom actually took that photo. Uh, and, you know, so since graduation, I've worked in a few cities around the southwest of the UK. Um, currently, I split my time between a clinic in Bristol, where I'm a general dentist. But two days a week, I travel to Salisbury where I do oral surgery in a hospital. So we take on the more challenging cases. Uh, and like, like Ling said, it's a very long drive when you work in the UK. So my, my commute from Bristol to, the, to Salisbury is an hour and a half, two hours drive. So what does a career in university, and what does a career in dentistry look like? The university degree ranges from four to six years. I believe the degree at NUS is four years. Most UK universities offer a five-year program with an extra year in the middle if you want to intercalate. And that's where you take an extra year to study another degree and you graduate with two qualifications instead of just one. So after getting your degree, there is a wealth of options you can choose. Uh, you could choose to be a general dentist, which is what I mainly do. And that's full of variety. You develop a really close relationship with your patients. Um, every year, you know, it feels like every year technological in innovations are very exciting, very rapid. There are new things to play with every year. It's also slowly become a woman-friendly career as well. Since 2018, uh, there have been more female dentists in the UK than male ones. So that's fantastic. Um, you could also choose from a very, very, very long list of specializations, all of which require further study. So I, I wrote some of them down, um, the ones that I could think of. So you could specialize in things like root canals, dentures, oral surgery, so on and so forth. Uh, now, this is important. If you do study dentistry, but you realize you actually don't really like it, which does happen, there's still plenty of options for you to use your knowledge. For example, you could go into public health uh, for advocacy and policy making. You could teach or do research. You could enter the legal side of the industry. And I also know people who focus mainly on running, growing, buying clinics, and they don't practice dentistry. I also know of some very successful dental, con uh, dental accountants and financial advisors who no longer practice as well. So the list does go on. But uh, I am one of the lucky ones. I definitely picked the, the right career for myself. I love being a dentist. I enjoy helping my patients, diagnosing their problems, helping their solutions. Um, but I, I know this isn't for everybody. You know, when you are asked to choose a future career when you're only a teenager, I think a lot of us know how difficult it is to get it right on the first try. Um, you, you pick something maybe because everybody else does it or because your parents want you to and maybe it, is, it doesn't always, it's not always the right fit. So if you are thinking of being a dentist, I 100% recommend getting some work experience. The job can be very stressful. There is a lot of time pressure. Um, and you also need to be a good leader to your dental team. You also have to be a good team player. So those are two different things that you, you will have to balance. You need to be professional, but you also have to be very empathetic to your patients. Um, 
And I, I feel as society increasingly, you know, there's a lot more knowledge, there's a lot more information out there. People read a lot before coming to your, your appointments. People take ownership of their own health choices. So you have to be there to guide your patients and inform and educate them. This can require a lot of, a lot of patience and it, it, it can be tricky, you know. Um, you need to continually update your learning as well. The, le the learning really is lifelong. So um, my advice is get some work experience. But when you do, don't just watch what the dentist does with your hands. Don't just watch their technical skills. You really have to listen to what they say to their patients, how they manage their team. Think about how they convey information um, and how they try to make their patients comfortable in a very uncomfortable clinical setting. That is definitely an essential skill. Now, uh, I know not many people like going to the dentist. Sometimes dentistry can seem like a very mysterious topic. So I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes talking about some dental issues that are becoming much more prevalent in today's society. So uh, as our society becomes more affluent and more educated, many more people take better care of their teeth by cleaning them more effectively. They also have access to better products now. Most people also know the link between sugar and teeth decay, and there are a lot more sugar-free diet options available. Public health measures have also done a great job at reducing the risk of the rate of dental decay, uh, especially in Singapore, where the water is fluoridated. So now that we are living longer lives, we're keeping our teeth for longer, and you also have the knowledge and the tools to reduce decay on your teeth, there are some other problems that start to emerge. So tooth surface loss. That's a very fancy way of just saying wear and tear. It's becoming a much bigger problem because some of the risk factors include things like stress, eating disorders, and also foods that we consider to be healthier choices. If you take a look at a diagram on screen, you can see that the thick white outermost layer of the tooth is called enamel, and that's the toughest part of the tooth. If that's worn away, then the yellow layer, which is called dentine, will be exposed. Uh, dentine is a lot more sensitive. So Tooth surface loss, wear and tear, often leads to sensitivity and pain. It can be very difficult to treat. And if the tooth gets worn down all the way until the nerve is exposed, uh, then often it's, it might be too difficult to save the tooth. It has to be extracted. So patients with tooth surface loss can often feel like their teeth don't look nice or that their teeth um, doesn't match. It, they, look, they make them look older than they actually are. So there are several types of tooth surface loss. I'm going to be focusing on erosion today. Erosion is caused by prolonged exposure of teeth to acid, which slowly dissolves the enamel away. The bottom right-hand side picture, the one with a lot of teeth on it, that's a nice example of teeth with very little wear and tear. You can see it, it looks big, chunky, lots of a nice white coating around all of it. And the other two pictures show how the enamel has begun to dissolve. And you can see the yellower, the yellow shine of the dentine coming through. There's a little yellow um, arrow on the, on the upper right-hand side picture. And that is, you can see that little pink dot, that's actually the nerve almost shining through in there. And you can imagine that patients with unprotected teeth like this will find it difficult to eat or drink anything without cold or pain. The teeth are also weaker and more prone to fracture. There are many, many, many sources of diet in our uh, sources of acid in our diet. Here are some common ones, and you will see that many of them are drinks. And that's because over the course of the day, you may only have three or four meals, but you may be continuously sipping on some of these drinks all day long. That means that the acid in these drinks are bathing over your teeth over and over again, which doesn't give your mouth the chance to balance its pH and uh, the acid will just slowly erode at your enamel. If you look at these drinks, on the, uh, some of them are actually healthier choices, such as Coke Zero, which doesn't contain sugar, but it's still very acidic. Lemon water and fruit teas are another very trendy option uh, for healthier drinks. Um, even tea and coffee, especially if you drink them black, or even like fruity bubble tea, even if you have zero sugar in your fruit bubble tea, they can be acidic enough to cause a problem. Uh, I also want to take some time to mention medical conditions like acid reflux. So up to 30% of acid reflux is silent, 
meaning that you might not have any symptoms of any pain at all with, with your acid reflux. It's just slowly eating away at your teeth. And your dentist might be one of the first people to notice this. Um, so it is important to have regular checkups with your dentist. Unfortunately, eating disorders also feature here. Patients who are bulimic often have acid wear on the backs of their top teeth because uh, of the way they vomit, the, the acid just comes straight through. It just coats the backs of your front teeth. Um, anorexic, anor anorexic patients may also have very acidic diet choices as a means of coping. Um, so treating patients like this is very difficult because as a dentist, you are trained to spot these signs and encourage the patient to speak to you about any difficulties with managing their condition and just ensuring they know where to find help and support. I, I do have patients who do sit in a chair and they open up to me or they're being very open and honest with me. Or sometimes you just have to ask them the right questions before um, patients decide they will trust you and, 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 and share with you their problems with their eating disorders. Uh, I acknowledge there's very little I can do to treat the underlying cause because that requires specialized and very multidisciplinary involvement. But I do my best to support my patients with advice and dental interventions. So if you think you have dental erosion, please see your dentist. Early diagnosis and management is key here. Here are some advice I tend to give my patients, but again, you should see your dentist to manage your condition holistically. Okay? Um, so the first thing is a diet diary. This is where you log everything you eat or drink, anything that goes in your mouth okay, in a span of three days. And this helps you actually realize and locate the acidic sources in your diet. Look at the ingredients label on your food. Uh, this will help you pick up anything that says acid, stuff like citric acid, which is a very common uh, flavor addition. The next step is to reduce the amount of acid. It's not just the, how often you have an acidic food, but also how long you spend with, for example, the drink. Uh, like if you have one can of Diet Coke with lunch and one more for dinner, that's two cans, but that is better than sipping on one can all day long as you work while you tap on your laptop. Because even though you drink less of the of the of the diet coke in general the time the drink spends in contact with your teeth is much longer and it does a lot more damage the other food that you eat at the same time and the saliva you produce will also dilute the acid so if you do have an acidic drink try to have it with your with a meal um, don't brush your teeth right after you have acidic food because you, you might think that you're, you're getting rid of the acid, but um, your enamel is slightly weaker right after having some acidic food or drink. And if you keep scrubbing at it, you actually end up, end up wearing away the enamel even faster. Um, so if you have a medical condition that creates an acidic environment in your mouth, please seek medical advice, right? Things like acid reflux, eating disorders, or maybe even if you're vomiting because of, um, for example, in the first trimester of pregnancy. If you do vomit, please don't brush your teeth right after either. Instead, rinse with some water or rinse with some mouthwash and wait for 45 minutes before any sort of brushing. There are lots of mouthwash products on the market uh, and you can speak to your dentist to pick what's best for you. So I'm going to skim quickly over the other causes of tooth surface loss. Uh, the, one of them is overbrushing. You can see on these pictures right around the gums, uh, there the teeth have little cavities in them. They're not. That's not decay. That's actually from overbrushing. And the, the picture at the bottom, there's a little chip right on that. Those two front teeth, very very common. Okay. Um. So you should see your dentist for tailor advice if you think this is happening to you. Um. There are little things that we can do to help make it better, but the good news is that all these habits can be controlled by yourself. Things like overbrushing, biting on your fingernails, biting on your lip piercing, biting on pens when you do your work. You just have, it's a matter of identifying that you have these habits and taking steps to stopping. So grinding and stress. Now, this is a topic so big that it really should be its own lecture. But again, if you are grinding your teeth, don't think of it as something normal that you've always done. It's something that you should work on managing and you should see your dentist for tailored advice. Everybody is different. People manage stress in different ways. Unfortunately, it's not something that we can just escape. And a lot of us end up taking it out on our teeth by grinding. You could be grinding your teeth during the day when you're driving. You could be 
grinding your teeth when you're working or in a stressful situation. Uh, it could also happen when you're asleep and unaware, and that's one of the hardest ones to control. Um, this doesn't just cause wear and tear on your teeth. Uh, it can also cause chipping and fractures of your teeth, but it can also make your jaw joint really hurt. So your jaw joint will be located right here. You can feel it when you open and close your mouth, something just moving and, uh, around in there. Um, so you can, the pain from your jaw joint can present in many different ways. Some people have headaches or migraines. Other people have what feels like toothache or earache. Some people can't chew on anything hard without it being painful. It can be very difficult to diagnose and, and even more difficult to treat successfully. So do, don't wait for it to get really bad. Just see your dentist. <laughs> now for the last five minutes, I'm gonna shift the focus to another newly emerging dental problem. Uh, and that's uh, social media. I'm sure all of you are aware of some of the more damaging issues that social media can bring. Those two beautiful girls on, uh, I put up there, they are reality TV stars in the UK. They have millions of social media followers. If you watch Love Island, and I'm only going to confess to watching this one season, uh, these two girls, they are Molly Mae and Amy from season five. They've been, you know, to their credit, relatively open and honest about the cosmetic work they've had, including dental veneers, which they had the, put on before the show. And then after the show, they actually you know, didn't like them that much. They took them off, had them redone again, just to improve the appearance. Um, however, many other celebrities, they are not as open about the treatment that they've received. I mean, they do pass off the results of tens of thousands of dollars of dental treatment as their natural teeth. And all this is creating an environment where we feel pressured to have hyper-perfect teeth. Teeth that, that are essentially unnatural, and this fixation can be very damaging to self-esteem and to your dental health. Uh, I do find myself spending more and more time with my patients, reassuring them that their teeth are healthy, they're absolutely a normal color and shape. Yes, it is true that some people will benefit from cosmetic dentistry, but it's extremely important to distinguish patients who have valid concerns about their dentition from patients who have some degree of body dysmorphia because the patients with body dysmorphia, there is no dentistry that will make them feel better. It's a mental condition, it's not a dental one. It is extremely important that these patients are identified and encouraged to seek professional medical help um, because even if they do not receive dental treatment from a dentist, even if a dentist says, no, I think you've got a bit of body dysmorphia, I'm not going to treat you, even if they say that, these patients can still find treatment somewhere else with much worse effects. So risky choices, these are becoming much more common. Uh, everyday dentists see the effects of DIY treatment on products that have been bought off the internet. The most common one is teeth whitening gel. Uh, these should be safely prescribed by your dentist after they look at your dental health and your gum health. Whitening gels so online or through a beautician are actually illegal in the UK, but this is very hard to regulate because you see lots of these um, products being sold through social media as well. So the picture, which shows a very ugly kind of burn around the gum, that is what can happen from uh, illegal whitening gels. The concentration can often be too strong. And uh, if you're not wearing a, 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 a guard that's well fitted to put the gel in, it can start to leak around your gums and it can cause burns that are uh, un unfortunately sometimes permanent. Other products are simply ineffective. Uh, so the best way to get a trusted product is going through your dentist. DIY instructions can be simply unsafe. This one found here on Pinterest. Uh, if you look at it, it has lemon juice, it has baking soda. It's very acidic and very abrasive. Uh, and if you apply that on your teeth over a long period of time, that's just going to leave you with a lot more wear and tear. Many patients are also unaware of the extent of dental work required to have veneers or crowns. So uh, I've got a picture up for on another UK celebrity. This is Katie Price, who to her credit was also very open to the public about some failed dental work that she received um, cheaply. I say cheaply because it's cheaper, but it's still not cheap. Okay? But things can go wrong. Like in Katie Price's case, her crowns fell off during the UK COVID lockdown and she couldn't travel to back to where she had them done to have them fixed. So here she, she's showing off that's her natural teeth, which have been filed down to little stumps before her crowns were put on. Now, 
not many people realize that when they ask for crowns for, for beauty purposes, that your teeth need to be cut away and shaped like this first. Um, crowns are beneficial if you're like protecting a broken tooth or after you need after you had a root canal. But if you're only for cosmetic purposes, then you need to think about what you are sacrificing as well. It's it's uh unfortunately um it, it's really important to try and maintain your natural anatomy as much as possible. You've got to remember that nothing lasts forever. Crowns on average, maybe 10, 15 years, you know, and if it breaks, what are you going to do next? What are your next options? So if you are considering having extensive cosmetic dentistry, you should go to a reputable dentist so you, they, you, you can be told of all the risks and you can make an informed choice. There are many, many fantastic dentists in Singapore. A lot of them are very well trained in, in, in techniques that are minim, minimally invasive, you know, um, as gentle and as conservative as possible. So you are a spot for choice. Before I end off, I just wanted to highlight some of the latest research developments. We now have new research showing that gum disease can play a role in poor blood sugar regulation, uh, and uh, which exacerbates diabetes, of course. Um, the type of bacteria present in gum disease can also travel, travel through your bloodstream, therefore increasing the risk of heart disease, increasing the risk of heart attacks and strokes. Gum disease has also been shown to increase the risk of Alzheimer's and vascular dementia and also increases the rate of decline in these two illnesses. There are also further investigations into the impact on osteoporosis and adverse pregnancy events, two topics I feel are very pertinent to women, especially because gum disease can worsen during pregnancy and menopause due to the hormonal levels. Um, interestingly enough, studies on COVID-19, uh, even though they're still really early, there is a possibility that patients with gum disease tend to have poorer outcomes when, when they are unfortunately, uh, when they are unfortunately have um, COVID-19. And this is possibly from secondary infections affecting your respiratory system. More research has, has also been done into looking at the importance of the oral microbiome and its role in regulating your gut health and issues like obesity and diabetes. So in conclusion, please take care of your teeth and your gums. Dental health affects your whole body and your well, entire well-being as well. Hopefully you will have learned some new tips on caring for your teeth that go beyond the usual brushing and flossing. But yes, it is important that you are cleaning between your teeth with floss or interdental brushes um, that promotes good gum health. Um, see your dentist before things become a problem. They are often more difficult to fix as time goes on. And lastly, don't believe everything you see online. Many beautiful smiles are natural. Some others are just the result of a lot of money. Um, the health of your teeth is important. So please speak to your professional before making treatment decisions. So if you want to know anything else about me or my journey to become a dentist or my life in the UK or any questions about dental health, please leave me a question in the Q&A session. Uh, I'm really sorry, I, I cannot help you with any sort of personal dental issues, you really will have to see your own dentist for a full checkup of your health, but I can definitely help you with any sort of general queries. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I hope you enjoyed my little talk. And I've always wanted to say this at the end, Philly, I'm really Ivy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alison. I was just, I, te I typed it in the group chats that if every dentist looks like you and speaks like you, um, there'll be no problem with dental visits. Everybody will be a dentist. <laughs> Give me one second. Yes. And um, I learned so much from your talk. Uh, two of my favorite drinks, lemon, juice, lemon water and red wine. I have to be more careful after drinking it. Absolutely. Yeah, there's so many things to learn from you. And also coronary heart disease, um, uh, you know, with uh, gum disease, you know, um, so many things can be affected. So it's not just oral health, right? It affects the entire body, oral microbiome. So much to learn from you. Thank you so much, Alison. Welcome. Next uh, person I'd like to bring up, uh, we'll speak on a very, very important topic. Uh, Miss Emily Lim from Resilience Collective. Miss um, Lim was an RGS alumna from the class of 1999 and graduated from NUS on Dean's List with a Bachelor of Laws LLB in 2006. 
She spent four years in legal practice in two boutique mid-sized firms in the fields of commercial litigation and corporate law. Thereafter, she transitioned to pursue a career in the non-profit and social services sector after completing a master's in science in international public policy at UCL. She's part of the founding team that launched Resilience Collective, a registered mental health charity and IPC with a mission to reshape the way we approach mental health. She currently manages strategy and development of new programs at Resilience Collective. Prior to that, Evelyn worked with the National Council of Social Service and the National Volunteer and Philanthropy Center in the areas of capacity building for the social care and giving ecosystem. She has extensive grassroots and community building experience through volunteering in Singapore, Cambodia, Thailand, and in the UK. Emmeline is also trained in mental health, first aid, and community suicide prevention. Emily, over to you. Thanks, Jock. Let me just share my screen. I hope you can see my screen. Is it all good? Okay, hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Just to round up the um, the, the trio of speakers today, I'm glad to be with you all. I'm Emeline from the class of 1999. I'm here to you know share just a little bit about mental health and this topic of overcoming adversity. I uh, just want to caveat that I'm not here sharing from a clinical perspective. So none of this is meant to be a substitute for professional medical opinion, but I hope to be able to share with you an additional um, and slightly more personal perspective on this important topic. Um, as somebody who has been fortunate enough to <laughs> have um, lived through a mental health um, experience. So um, I will touch on various relevant aspects of my story as we go along this presentation. Uh, my mental health concerns started to emerge shortly after graduating from university, where I studied law. So looking back, it was really a confluence of different factors which led to that perfect storm um, when, you know, which led to me eventually being diagnosed with clinical depression. And the next few years were very tough. Um, struggling to cope with the new diagnosis, cope with the illness, as well as returning to work in private law firms um, with the extremely long hours, the very demanding work environment. So that, that was a whole journey in itself. Um, eventually, um, as part of my, my whole recovery journey, I made the decision to pivot into the helping profession. And that led to me pursuing a master's um, and transitioning into the nonprofit and the social services sector. So for the last four years, I've been working in the mental health social services sector in various capacities, from sector building to strategy and as well as taking care of programs. Currently, I'm at Resilience Collective. Uh, we call ourselves a peer powered platform. So our vision and mission is to really pro promote the value of lived expertise as um, as a complement to clinical expertise. And this knowledge and perspective and being able to benefit and empower those who have mental health challenges. So what is mental health? According to the World Health Organization, mental health is actually more than the absence of mental disorders. It's actually a state where we can flourish. So it's really about our our holistic well-being, where we can realize our potential, cope with normal stresses of life, um, work productively, um, and also have the ability to contribute to our community. So mental health is, is really an integral part of health, um, and indeed there's no health without mental health. So we all have mental health um, just as we all have physical health. And you know, how we feel can vary from having good mental well-being to having difficult feelings and emotions, where it's 
um, at the level of mental distress. Um, and then it can, it can actually escalate to more severe mental health problems and even mental illness if um, we're not able to spot it uh, uh, early enough and, and able to take steps to intervene. So mental, uh, poor mental health is when we're actually struggling with low mood, stress or anxiety. Um, and we can all go through periods of experiencing poor mental health. It's really a spectrum of different moods and experiences. But the good news is that we can actually shift our state of mental health by recognizing the signs of distress early um, and taking steps to strengthen our mental well-being. Um, being able to strengthen our resilience through good self-care and coping skills before it, it you know, shifts to the other side um, where we look at mental illness. And when mental illness occurs, that's when a person is really unable to function in their everyday life due to very drastic changes in their emotions, thinking or behavior or a combination of those. So these are some of the national statistics um, in our Singapore landscape, which I think are quite sobering. Uh, basically, according to the Singapore Mental Health Study in 2016, um, where they surveyed um, a, a, a sample population of more than 6,000 adults in Singapore, uh, one in seven have actually experienced a mental health condition in their lifetime. And these are the top three um, mental disorders that were identified um, as being most, most prevalent in the Singapore population. So top of it was depression, followed by alcohol abuse and obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and most importantly, although one in seven of us will experience a mental health condition in our lifetime, actually more than 75% do not seek help. So these are according to the national statistics. Um, these next two slides, you know, also serve to further substantiate why, why should we care about mental health? So even before the pandemic, um, we already see that burnout was a very common problem here. Singaporeans um, had a lot of stress-related illnesses that actually cost our economy um, a great deal. And in Asia, nine in 10 of the respondents actually said they were very stressed and um, as many as eight out of 10 said they were in an always on culture. So the pandemic and its related challenges actually brought to the fore the relevance of mental health to all of us. Um, you know, we, we all can experience varying mental health challenges to different degrees. Um, and actually the last Singapore mental health study also showed that women aged between 18 and 34 are actually more than twice as likely as men to suffer from depression. Um, the causes could be because uh, women face, you know, a greater variety of stressors, um, but also it, it could be an underreporting on, on the male side of things because um, they're maybe less, uh, less uh, willing to come forward and talk about it. And yeah, I mean, even though we have vaccines rolling out, you know, Experts predict that COVID-19 will have a long, long tail effect on our mental health. Um, another vulnerable group are the youths. So the prevailing evidence is that um, youths and those transiting into the workforce actually are a group with higher risk and higher, higher prevalence of mental disorders. So according to statistics, one in five young people will actually have a mental health condition. Um, and it's likely that on the ground, this number might be even higher due to underreporting of figures. And fa fear of failure has been identified even before COVID as um, a big concern among Singaporean students. So the percentage of Singaporean students who actually express a fear of failure or um, express low confidence um, is significantly higher than the OECD average. Um, so the situation, you know, would also have been made worse by the pandemic. Um, this is findings from a recent sur APEC survey done by a communications firm um, of over a thousand Gen Z youths. And 73% actually reported 
um, experiencing more stress due to COVID-19, and 57% felt that their mental health had worsened, but um, only about 40% felt comfortable actually talking about their mental health. So what are some of the, the causes and signs of mental health challenges? Um, this is the biopsychosocial model of mental health. It, it actually illustrates that mental health is multifaceted and multifactorial. Um, in my personal experience, these symptoms that you see on the left, symptoms of mental unwellness, these appeared at the onset of my mental health condition, but it was actually a little late by then. Um, I never expected myself to have a mental health condition, and I was not an obvious candidate for it, actually, because there were no obvious risk factors. Um, I was not from any dysfunctional family background. I was actually from a pretty comfortable family background. I was, I was actually very positive and sociable at school. I was not exposed to any harmful or risky environments or behaviors. So hence, you know, it just goes to show that mental illness really does not discriminate by socioeconomic background or, or other general factors. Um, out of these three um, elements that we see on the Venn diagram, I would say um, where I was weak or rather the biggest contributing factor for me was really the psychological environmental kind of factors where I had a lot of negative internalized self-beliefs and um, not very um, well-defined coping skills. And, and the difficulties actually started to surface around the time I was 14 or 15. And, you know, it started to snowball over the next eight or nine years until I, I got an actual diagnosis. So from my journey, um, I would say, you know, that there were a lot of, you know, what would have, have helped? Yeah, what would have helped my mental health from worsening? would have been really firstly even having more mental health literacy in my teenage years um, being able to recognize some of those emotional warning signals about how I was um, maybe reacting quite disproportionately to certain setbacks or disappointments um, was not able to open up or find healthy ways to manage some of these difficult emotions um, and instead I suppress them. And I think uh, Ling also talked about that earlier about you know, the need to be able to talk about it because if you just keep suppressing your emotions, they, they, will, kind of, they will kind of bite you back, um, yeah, like further down the road. Um, also, yeah, you know, knowing how to, understanding my own strengths and leveraging on those more. But I think instead what I did was I, I kind of discounted my own strengths and I just wanted to conform to other expectations or like what, you know, what does a res respectable career look like? So in, in, in that case, I, I chose to study law, but um, it, it wasn't done out of a, you know, like a true passion for it. And also if I had, had developed a meaningful concept of self-care, um, yeah, that, that would have gone a really long way. So in terms of, um, yeah, knowing when to, to kind of regulate, um, knowing when I was pushing myself too hard, you know, I really didn't have a concept of pausing, taking a break, um, going to do something else that would rejuvenate me and then coming back to, to the thing that was stressful. Um, and lastly, um, knowing how to practice self-compassion. Yeah, I think that would have helped me to, um, yeah, not to constantly overextend myself and to recognize that, um, yeah, I, I had to practice self-compassion and self-love. Um, okay, so these are just some other voices of other peers from the Resilience Collective community, just to show you a glimpse of their different obstacles and triumphs in their mental health recovery uh, because so far I've only talked about my perspective but I think from our community from the different voices that we've heard um, you know these these were also there are certain themes that actually um, rang true across all of our different experiences uh, for example Bernadette on the top left 
where she was just working 16 hour days, 10 days straight and having crying bouts, panic attacks, but just trying to switch on a professional mode at work. So she, she really felt like something needed to change, something needed to stop, but she convinced herself she had no time to address her issues. And then after that, she hit rock bottom. Um, these peers on the right, they, it really helped them when they stopped running away from certain in, internal emotions or things that they felt hard to express, but they tried to really identify their feelings. And that was when they started to be honest about what they were going through and that allowed them to heal. Um, and speaking up really did a great uh, deal of good for them as well. So allowed them to feel heard and understood. And um, recovery, if, if you or anyone you know has a mental health challenge, um, I would, yeah, I would just like to also encourage you to educate yourself a little bit more and also understand that the recovery journey is not a straightforward linear process. So a lot of times um, there'll be relapses. We just have to take it one day at a time, but, but gradually um, hope really keeps them sustaining, um, keeps them moving forward, even though one day it's, it could be just one small step forward or they're crawling towards their goal. Other days they may be running towards it. Uh, but what's important is that um, yeah, we, we recognize that, you know, nobody wants to stay um, in a bad place and we're all moving at our own pace and at our own time. And yeah, one of our peers, um, over eight years, she slowly started rebuilding a more healthy relationship with her emotions and her body um, and channeling her stress into other types of uh, creative pursuits. Um, Okay, so just a little bit about how can we strengthen our mental well-being and resilience. Um, I, I do like this, you know, this short excerpt, this quote about what resilience looked like. So I think it's being able to use our feelings as a source of information, um, being able to describe the resources we have both internally and externally, and being confident in saying what's important to us and Importantly, to know that we have a choice. We, we can make a choice about our next step. Um, these are some of the things I've found that are some concrete steps we can take on a daily basis to, to build our resilience, to help us stay well. So if you think about, you know, resilience as just like your personal toolbox of, of different things that you have at your disposal. And um, depending on the situation, um, you, you can pull them out. So it could be different routines or um, habits that, that you, you find recharge you. So for me, um, it's spending time in nature or um, uh, yeah, getting, at least getting some movement, going for a short run, doing even a YouTube workout at home. Um, I think offering support to others and seeking support is also really important. So on days when I, you know, I may feel like I'm doing great and I'm like bring, brimming with positivity. That's when I can lend a hand to others, like just offer some encouragement to, to others that I know are not having such a good time. And, and on days when I'm really down, um, yeah, friends have never failed to be able to, yeah, on days when you, you can't really remember you know, your own strengths or you can't see yourself for, for who you are, then others can remind you, you know, of your strengths and others can remind you that right now you're, you know, you're going through a very depressive period. You're having a lot of self-defeating um, thoughts, but this is not the real you and we know you and we love you for, yeah, the real you. So um, yeah, these are all um, small, tools that, that you can um, also put into your own, that you can also put into use. Um, these are some coping strategies. So there are emotion-based and problem-based coping skills. Emotion-focused coping skills are more when you, you're not really able to influence the outcome. You're not really able to control the situation. 
then it's it's about how you manage your emotions around that. So it could be like, yeah, putting on some aromatherapy candles or uh, just doing something to, to help you manage that, get through that period. And when it's something that um, you know you can put together a plan to influence the outcome, then that's when you put into play a more problem-focused type of coping strategy. Um, so... So um, about, you know, thinking about our well-being, it's actually a very holistic thing. It can actually encompass these eight dimensions, um, all the way from your emotional to your financial, social, even spiritual, intellectual uh, well-being. So, yeah, I mean, I think for all of us, we can consider what, what helps us cope and what we can, what are some of these um, self-care practices that we can incorporate into our daily lives. Um, and just a word on sleep as well, um, you know, echoing some what, of, what some of the other speakers were, were mentioning. Um, sleep problems um, can, can actually lead to changes in your mental health. So poor sleep, including insomnia, can contribute to initiating or worsening mental health problems. So it can both be a cause and a consequence. Um, so I think, you know, the minimum seven, half, seven and a half hours of sleep is absolutely crucial for your brain to repair itself and uh, to flush out all those toxins so it'd be recharged for the next day. Um, so this slide is about, you know, just to elaborate on part of how we can um, strengthen our resilience. One of the pointers was about maintaining perspective. So if you think about like, you know, the different circles of influence, if, if it's something that is within your control, then you can think about the options you have and what action you can take to get started. But if it's not fully within your control and are there still things you can influence and who in your support network could you approach? And if it's completely outside of your control, then that's where we try to reframe our perspective on the thing. Um, and this is um, a, a model used by Martin Seligman, who is a popular psychologist. Um, the difference between thinking whether something is personal, um, pervasive and permanent, you know, that helps us to reframe um, by not making a situation like entirely your fault or, you know, thinking that it will be permanent and pervasive. How are we doing for time? <laughs> okay. Okay, so I just have like a, a short video. Um, I'll play it because I just think it's, it's yeah, I mean, whoever in the audience who, you know, if you are, you, you have, you're supporting a loved one or a friend with mental health difficulties, um, just play a short video to, to emphasize the importance of empathy. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's, a, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment. No. Not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, I'm down. I know what it's like down here and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no, you want a sandwich? Uh, 
Empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had it, yeah. And we do it all the time because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, oh, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Yes, hi. So, Okay, we're back. Um, you know, just so just to sum up that video, um, well, so to any of you out there who may be supporting somebody with a mental health challenge, while we may not all, we may not always grasp the full extent of their mental health struggles, um, let us not judge, but approach them with openness, you know, so educate yourselves um, and just seek to be just seek to be a friend to, to, to that someone who you're supporting. Um, in conclusion, um, I guess the message of, of my sharing today is, you know, just to remind us all that we can't afford to take our mental health for granted because it's not always obvious when someone may or may not fall um, susceptible to it. Um, there, but there are things we can do to strengthen our mental resilience. And mental health really concerns everyone because even if it's just one in seven who have a mental health challenge, but you know those people are family members and friends of other people. So in the sense, in that sense, everybody is touched by mental health in some way or other. And being open really helps us to reduce the stigma and um, to help those of us who need support to be able to step forward and seek help. And if um, you're in need of any resources or helplines, these are just some. Um, helpful numbers that you may avail yourself of. There's the National Care Hotline, which is which was launched during COVID, but it has continued as a sustained counseling helpline for emotional well-being. Um, yeah, and, and different, you know, the government has done quite a few of these um, self-assessment tools and things like that. So you feel free to access these. Um, and yeah, we'll talk more in the Q&A. Thank you. So thank you very much to all three of our speakers and uh, especially I think the very, very personal sharing. Um, I think it's really much appreciated by all of us. Um, maybe we did have some questions and we will direct because I, I, I do know we are running about 30 minutes past our original time. Um, but maybe I'll just leave it to Jok to wrap up for us. We will be having more of these uh, medical uh, webinars over the course of the year and we will be sending out all that information as well later but uh, just right now over to Jo. Thank you so much Suyen, uh, my chairperson for the medical task force, uh, RGSA webinar medical task force. Um, very very grateful to you Suyen and to our speakers, Huiling, Alison, Emeline, to the person working background, Shimin, and also our CTO, Hui Shan. Um, just so grateful. This whole village made this work. Very grateful to everyone for attending and uh, bearing with us, for grinning and bearing with us. Such a prophetic um, title, Suyen, you've given to this webinar. Um, 
And um, without, but you know, there's so much I've gleaned. I also want to make a conclusion. I mean, summary of, of what you have spoken, Emily. What you have spoken has really touched me, and, and I'm sure it touched everyone. We can only imagine what you've gone through, and you have actually given a real voice to mental health. You have demystified it. Uh, you have made it so real to us. And indeed, you are in the helping profession, and we're really grateful to you. Um, so thank you. Further ado. Um, I want to bid everyone a big thank you, but before you go, right, like Su Yan say, we will have more of such webinars and uh, keep a lookout for it and we'll be in touch with you. To all the students who've attended, we hope that this has helped you uh, to make your decisions when you want to be a doctor, you know who to approach. Hui Leng, Su Yan, Emmeline, and of course, for big, big questions on mental health, you know who to expose. Emmeline, you're our role model. So thank you everyone. Um, have a good weekend. See you again soon.